Okay, so uh, hello everyone. I have the pleasure of uh, introducing to you all um, the second guest speaker from Martina Center Harvard Medical School, Bruce Fischel, uh, who will be telling us a little bit about multi-scale analysis of the human brain. So just to briefly introduce Bruce to uh, those of you who haven't met him yet. So Bruce Fischel is a professor of radiology at the Martina Center for Biomedical Engineering, uh, by medical imaging, rather, Harvard Medical School and an affiliated researcher at MIT. His research involves the development of techniques for cortical surface modeling, thickness measurement, intersubject registration, and whole brain segmentation, and cross scale imaging. Correct. So, the FreeSurfer software that he's uh, well known for. Uh, um, has been downloaded over 50,000 times and is in use in labs all around the world. So I'm hoping that some of you have also used FreeSurfer. If not, please download it and uh, register for a license. Um, don't pirate it, it's free. Right. So uh, off to you, Bruce. Thanks, Sean. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm gonna talk about uh, multi-scale image analysis of the human brain. Um, I think going after Ishvan's lovely talk is perfect because we're addressing a lot of the same issues. I think that we're um, there are a lot of synergies there. Um, and if you want to understand human brain structure and function, then you must do multi-scale analysis because structures in the human brain that are important to cognition occur across an astonishing range of scales. You know, more than a million fold in terms of voxel volume, from the micro to the to the macro. You know, let alone to the nano scale. So uh, it takes a village. There are a lot of people who contributed to this work. I will try and point them out as I go along. Um, here's Sean here on the right. Oh, I should, uh, let's see. Do you guys see my mouse or do I need to get a cursor? Yes, sir. Can you try to wiggle around and see if we can see it? We can see it, but yeah, it's, it's, small. Yeah, it's a little small, but it's fine. Uh, okay, let's see if I can find that. Okay, I probably won't use it very much anyway. Okay, so the talk is going to have three parts. Um, I'm going to start with some background and motivation, kind of talking about the state of the art as it was, I don't know, 10 ish years ago and the problems that we want to solve uh, with, with the existing state of the art. Then I'll talk about building a common coordinate framework in the human brain and their kind of unique challenges to the human brain, possibly not unique, you know, language using great apes, Coco the gorilla, for example, um, probably represent similar problems, but listen to cephalic brains don't have a lot of the issues that I'm gonna talk about. If you wanna establish a common coordinate system for mice, then that's a much simpler problem than the human one. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about this, the work we've been doing, kind of putting it all together. You'll probably have seen a little bit of this before because Yale is intimately involved with it. And, um, you know, the stuff he's doing with the vessels are um, a key component of this. Uh, and this will be similar to what you've seen uh, Mishvan with some twists that I'll point out. Okay, oh, I should ask that uh, I think Sean is monitoring the chat. If you have questions, you know, please interrupt me. I know I tend to go a little bit fast at times uh, and I'm not terribly good at slowing down. I'm better than I used to be, but still not terribly good on any like reasonable scale. So if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. I'm happy to chat about things as we go. OK, so here's a slide I put together um, that's kind of depressing. It took me like five minutes to put together. Uh, and it's a list of big things that we don't know about the human brain. And it's not meant to be exhaustive. There are lots of other things we don't know about the human brain. But to me, it's kind of astonishing that we're in 2023 and these big questions are still unanswered. You know, we can start with cortical areas. We we'll call them Broadman areas after Corbidian Broadman. Um, how many are there? How variable are they in size and location? Are they the same topology in every person? You know, is 45 always in front of 44? Or is it sometimes in back of it? Um, are they functional modules? You know, I'll show a little bit of data on this just because it's fun that we know that they are more or less functional modules in primary cortex, but we don't really know that as we get out of you know primary and secondary cortices. Um, we have some data showing that higher order, you know, higher order, that is association cortex areas are more variable in their location than lower order ones. Why is that true? We don't know. Um, what is the relationship between connectivity and broadband areas? You know, we kind of think of the strong definition of an, a cortical area as including connectivity. Does connectivity change abruptly at the boundary? We don't know the answer to that question. Um, and then just simple ones. What is the normal distribution of cells across the brain? 
you know, do they, are they always bet cells in motor cortex and then you transition outside bet cells, you know, and they're, uh, you know, 12 cells per cubic hundred micron cube or something. Um, we have no idea. And this, this prevents us to, in our quest to understand normal brain function, but also to characterize pathology. Right? There's like a 40 year old theory of dyslexia where they found some dysmorphic cells somewhere in the parietal lobe. And it still has never been proven or disproven because we can't find that little spot in the parietal lobe where they found it. And these studies in neuropath are super difficult to do and they're done in a handful of subjects. So is that true of some types of dyslexia? Who knows, we don't know yet. Uh, and so we've been working quite hard to try and build the infrastructure. I should add that this is completely false advertising because I'm not going to answer any of these questions. Um, <clears throat> but I am going to try and um, uh, make the case for the infrastructure that needs to be built and the attempts that we've been undergoing to try and get to the point where we can answer these questions. Uh, and I think a lot of the lack comes, you know, okay, let me step back. Some of the lack comes on the imaging side. I think that on the imaging side, there's this big gap between high resolution 2D types, and by high resolution, I mean micron scale, and low resolution intrinsically 3D types like MRI. Um, but there are also gaps on the uh, analysis side. And I think we need analysis techniques that kind of merge the two, but also respect the geometric complexity of the human brain uh, while analyzing things like 2D data. Okay, so uh, standard histology is done this way. You take a brain, this is my brain. You stick a plane through it. In human, we usually do coronal. I don't know why. And then, you know, monkey, we usually do sagittal. I, who knows? Uh, but you take it, you put it flat, and then you look at it under a microscope, um, usually some little bit of it. And then you make assertions about something that you've stained under the microscope. And there were a series of papers written in the late 90s and early 2000s by the late great Carl Zillis uh, and Katrina Muntz at a group in Germany. Um, and they developed a technique that they called observer independent histology. It's a 2D technique. And what they did, um, okay, here I'll use my cursor. Yes, you can see the cursor? Yep. Okay. So they draw boundaries. So this is a photomicrograph of a nissel stain. Every black dot is a neuron, more or less. Um, they draw the gray white boundary here and the peel surface boundary here. And then they treat those two boundaries as capacitive plates and they solve the Laplace equation in the interior. And the reason they're doing this is they want to establish correspondence between the outer surface and the inner surface so that they can talk about, in some meaningful way, a point in the cortex. And when they say a point in the cortex, and when I say a point in the cortex, really what I mean is some traversal of the gray matter. So like this would be one point in the cortex. And you know the kind of underlying assumption here is the columnar one, that neurons in the same column of cortex, whatever that means, are more similar to each other functionally than they are if you move in the tangential directions. And so when we establish coordinate systems, we're gonna deal with the tangential directions differently than we're gonna deal with this, what I'll call the surface normal direction, but it's not really the surface normal for reasons I'll explain later. Okay, so in 2D histology, sorry, in this observer independent histology, what they did is they extracted some features from each one of these streamlines, uh, and then they compute a spatial covariance matrix from, uh, so at each point, They'll say, okay, I'll look at the six streamlines to the left of me. I'll compute a mean and, and a covariance. I'll look at the six streamlines to the right of me. I'll, com I'll compute a mean and a covariance. And then I'll compute the Mahalanobis distance between those two blocks of streamlines. And if the Mahalanobis distance is big, I'll say that's a putative cortical boundary. Something is changing in the interior of the gray matter from the blocks to the left to the blocks to the right. And so I'm going to say that because the gray matter is changing, that this may be a boundary between two cortical areas. Okay, and that's what's shown here, this kind of series of computations that ends up with a Mahalanobis distance at the bottom. And they published a series of papers using this technique, and it was a giant amount of work. I don't want to underestimate how much work it was. It was a huge contribution to understanding human neuroanatomy. Um, and these are images I stole from a couple of the papers. These are two of Katrin's papers in 2000 and 2004. And by and large, the conclusion of every paper was more or less the same, which is that microstructure is not predicted by macrostructure. And what they meant by that is that we are transitioning the cortex from one cortical area to another. So in the central sulcus, you know, you're going down into the bottom of it and you go from area 3A to 3B, there's no little bump or divot in the bank of the sulcus that tells you 
that there's a microscopic change in the properties of the tissue under that, uh, under that peel surface. Uh, and they looked at um, the accuracy of various coordinate systems uh, by taking a bunch of neurologically normal older adults who came to autopsy and kind of semi-manually, I mean, they, they say it's automated, but I think there's some semi, there's some manual steps in it, um, and delineated cortical areas in a bunch of subjects, in 10 subjects per area. I think they did 16 total, and I'll, for reasons I'll explain in a minute, they weren't all the same subject in, in each cortical area. Um, and then they just looked at the average, so that kind of frequency distribution um, of how often a cortical area was overlapping across subjects for each cortical area. And that's shown for four cortical areas here. So broad area 17, primary visual cortex on the left, and then primary, uh, broad area 18, one step up the cortical hierarchy, secondary visual cortex, and then language cortex, 44, 45. And here's the color scale. So full red means that all 10 subjects agreed that a point was in a given cortical area. And gray means all 10 subjects agreed that point was outside the cortical area. And so a perfect coordinate system would give you all red and all gray. Right? You would get a step function that says, I'm in the area, I'm 100% certain I'm in the area, and now I'm out of the area. I'm 100% certain I'm out of the area. And if we look at Robin area 17, primary visual cortex, V1, um, we can see that there's this tiny little dot of red in the middle where all 10 subjects agreed this was V1. But the majority of the distribution is down in these like greenish blue colors, so around four or five subjects, or maybe even and fewer. And if I go one step up the cortical hierarchy to V2, I'm not very far from the sensory periphery here, um, all the red goes away. And so I'm only looking at like these greens and, and cyan colors. Um, and then if we get out to Broca's area, it's a mess. Like the, these blue in Broca's area are areas in which no two subjects agree on the cortical label. Right? And so these volumetric cord systems, you know, I think they tried some nonlinear ones that helps a little bit, um, but it doesn't help a lot. These, and so these volumetric cord systems don't do a good job at predicting the boundaries of cortical areas. And of course, there could be two reasons for this. You know, one is that this is not the right coordinate system. Uh, and the second is that nature has played an unfortunate trick on us where the cortical folds kind of don't tell us anything about what's going on uh, beneath the surface. And we kind of know that's not true because when we look at a brain, you know, we'll look at a brain and we'll say, well, it's a language task. I see it frontally. It's near the frontal operculum. I'll call it Broca's area, right? So we know the folds are predictive of function to some extent and our tectonics. And so we were fortunate enough to get this data uh, we have a different way we do cortical uh, registration, which is using cortical geometry instead of image intensities. This is quite old now. Um, and so the procedure goes like this. We take each surface model. So I'm showing four peel surface models. We compute an invertible diffeomorphism to the sphere. We represent the geometry of each individual subject as functions on the unit sphere. So red and green here are folded in and folded out. So this, for example, is the Sylvian Fisher. This is the central sulcus. Then we compute a bunch of uh, statistics across subjects. Uh, we average them, you know, quite just average them. We, we could compute means and variances and such. And then we have an atlas coordinate system. And the game we'll play is to take each one of these individual red green spheres and move it around on the surface of the atlas red green sphere until we've established a coordinate system that has kind of accounted for the variability in individual neuroanatomy. And by construction, these are all diffeomorphisms. So I can go from one subject into the atlas and back out to another subject. And then we applied this to the same data. Katrina and Carl were kind enough to give us the data. Uh, we redid their study. I changed the color scale. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, but this is so old that it's not even redoable. Uh, and so here, yellow, full yellow means 100%. So all the subjects agreed. And down here in the gray and, and dark red colors are fewer subjects. And so if we look at V1 here on the right, we can see that V1 is perfectly predicted by cortical folds. There is no uncertainty left except this little two, two and a half millimeter boundary region here. So as I'm in the Calcarin sulcus, I transition from being completely certain I'm in V1 to completely certain I'm outside of V1. Uh, so it turns out the cortical folding patterns are perfect predictors of some areas, notably uh, primary sensory areas. As I go to V2, you know, the story is a little bit more complicated. There's a little bit more spread in the red. Um, but I can do a pretty good job of predicting when I'm in V2 or outside of V2. And 4445 <laughs> is um, a little bit more spread. You know, you can see that the red kind of goes up uh, superiorly in the frontal lobe. Um, but again, there's this large core of the area where we can say with 100% certainty, you know, given the small size of the study, uh, that we're in Broca's area or we're outside of Broca's area. So cortical folding patterns do a good job of predicting architectonic boundaries, but not a perfect job.
And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then what are the implications of this? Well, to me, there are real world, world implications that are critical um, based on our ability to localize these work areas. And this is one example. This is a photomicrograph. Um, actually, this slide was given to me by Brad Hyman and Gina Gustinak for both at MGH. Uh, and it's of entorhinal cortex. <clears throat> so entorhinal is this bizarre cortical area in the medial temporal lobe. Um, th these are photomicrographs of nissel stains. This is the gray-white boundary at the top. This is the peeled surface at the bottom. Um, this is a nissel stain, so each one of these little black dots is a neuron. And Toronto has this bizarre architecture where the layer two neurons come in, uh, in these cell dense islands and they're separated by these cell pore regions. So it's cell dense island, cell pore region, cell dense island, cell pore region. And they're spaced at about 250 microns. Um, and they're interesting for a number of reasons. They're interesting from the perspective of Alzheimer's because they're devastated early in the disease. This is one of the first cortical areas impacted by Alzheimer's disease. And so even in the cl clinically mildest form of diagnosis of Alzheimer, um, you can see that 60% of these neurons are dead. The layer two neurons are just wiped out. Um, and then the hippocampus becomes disconnected from the cortex because the peripheral path, the output axons of these neurons form the peripheral path through which neocortical information gets into the hippocampus. Um, anyway, so one day, oh, I don't know, like 20 years ago, I was having coffee with Brad Hyman and Brad was describing this cortical architecture to me and said, you should go looking for this because he knew we were doing ex vivo imaging. And so we took our 7T scanner this was like the week of Christmas, I don't know, 2003 or something. Um, it was great. We had every scanner in the center. Nobody was there. And we took a medial temporal lobe sample um, that Gene had blocked. And we put it in our 7T scanner for like 70 hours. And we imaged it at 100 micron isotropic. And here, whoops, yeah, you can see these layer two islands as these kind of bright spots. Here's one, here's one, here's one. And we can do things that are really difficult to do with histology, like re-slicing, because these are isotropic voxels. So we can stick a plane in layer two and look at a tangential section through layer two, and you can see these cell dense islands clear as day. And the reason this is important, you know, it's kind of a nice proof of principle that if you have $7 million, you can turn, you know, your 7T scanner into a hugely expensive microscope. But it has real world implications also because in Alzheimer's, it's increasingly clear that the name of the game is finding disease effects early. Once the neurons are gone, they're almost certainly not coming back. And so if we want to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease, we need to find it uh, earlier in the course than we currently can. And so finding it has kind of two components. You know, we have to make, quantify a disease effect, but we also have to find where that disease effect is spatially. Uh, and so we took this data uh, from, I think, 10 hemispheres. I can't remember at this point, something like 10. Uh, and we built spatial probability maps. So we aligned cortical folding patterns. We had manually delineated the boundaries of entorhinal cortex based on the presence or absence of these layer two neurons or islands. And we built a probability map shown here. And with the cortical folding pattern registration, we can project it to anyone. And specifically, we can project it to a set of Alzheimer's subjects. So that's what's shown here. These are data from uh, Randy Buckner. These are, again, very mild Alzheimer's. These are CDR rating 0.5. So they're kind of the miles, mildest end of the spectrum that you would call Alzheimer's. And on the right, you can see cortical thickness in AD, in the dark bars, and controls in the gray bars. And so already in the CDR 5.5 subjects, you can see that there's this robust thinning of the cortex that we can detect. And then the question is, is this just an effect that's everywhere? Right? Is it, if I stuck my ROI somewhere else in the brain, would I have found thinning in these subjects? And the answer is no. If I take my entorhinal cortex ROI and I translate it a couple centimeters posterior, the effect largely goes away. And that's what's shown on the left. And so this gives us some confidence that our estimation of the location of these things that we can't directly see is pretty good and is clinically useful. Okay, then I'll show you one more example just because of course it's everyone's favorite example of uh, function in uh, cortical research. Uh, and this is work with John Palameni. Um, you know, so I said our architectural areas, functional areas, and why do we want to model cortical folding patterns? And the reason is that the functional properties of the cortex in the human brain, and likely in many uh, higher mammals, are laid out as functions along the cortical surface. And the tangential directions are different than the surface normal direction. And so this is some work that John did. Uh, John and I had the same PhD advisor, Eric Schwartz, who has sadly died, who was a great scientist. Uh, and Eric, had worked out the mathematical model for how visual information that's, that's uh, impinges on the retina 
gets transformed in primary visual cortex. And it has kind of this astonishingly simple form, which is that if you treat the visual cortex, uh, uh, the retina as a complex plane, and the cortex is a complex plane, it's a complex blind map. And using this transform, John computed the inverse of it and said, what images do I have to show the retina if I want to paint the letter M on the brain? Okay. And if you do that and you put paint it on a surface model, you really can't see anything. And the reason that you can't see anything um, is that the cortical folding patterns obscure this very simple functional organization that we know exists in primary vision cortex. But if we inflate it like a balloon, you know, there's the M, there's the A. And so, so we know in the early cortical areas that there's this strong tie between function and structure, that the early visual areas are almost certainly bounded um, functionally in the same way they are bounded anatomically. I think I'll skip this one. Okay, so that's uh, at it for the background. I'm gonna go on to uh, common coordinate stuff. Is there any questions on, on that part? Okay, I will continue then. Okay, so what do we want out of a common coordinate framework for the human brain? Um, well, we would like cross subject alignment, of course. You know, um, We want a common coordinate system that aligns some relevant properties. I've shown you one that aligns critical folding patterns, but of course we want it to align other things as well. Um, and we want it to handle both the tangential and normal directions. So the cortical surface stuff I showed you was only in the tangential directions. That is, we're letting the, the folding pattern slide tangentially along the sphere, but we're explicitly not dealing with the third dimension, which is kind of in the surface normal direction. Uh, we would like close form geodesics, so we can compute distances between things, you know, and that's why we use the sphere. Um, and then, of course, we want to do things like extract summary statistics and modes and templates from, from um, the cortical system. Okay, so what do we want to align? There's a lot of stuff we want to align. You know, I've told you we'd like to align site architecture, but we'd like to align other things, mylar architecture, vaso architecture, chemo architecture, genetics, computivity, functional properties, geometry, pathology. But we don't know if this is possible, right? Maybe these things don't line up with each other. Uh, and this is an open question in neuroscience. If I line up all the vessels, am I also lining up cortical areas? Maybe, I mean, you know, there's a reason to expect that. Uh, you know, there is there are blood flow requirements that are different. You know, in areas like V1 that, that have um, a lot of metabolic usage as opposed to somewhere else. Uh, but we don't know the answer to these questions. And so, we set out to build a cord system that enabled us. Okay, uh, that enabled us to separate uh, kind of training from testing. And what I mean by that is that it's possible that we'll be able to observe some of these things in small numbers of subjects, right? I mean, Ishvan just showed some slides where he had, you know, PLI on, on the small number of subjects. And we've got myelo, myelin stains and missile stains and that kind of thing. But it's likely we're gonna have them on 10 subjects, 20 subjects, 50 subjects, but we're not gonna have them in UK biobank size studies. We're not gonna have 10,000 of them. And so we would like to build some procedure that allows us to separate kind of what we use to understand the relationship between different properties and what we use at test time to do the registration itself. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I'll skip this one too. Okay. Uh, so as a test case, what we're using is some data from Ev Federenko. So Ev is a neuroscientist at um, MIT. She has um, really, to my mind, revolutionized the field of studying human language function. This is an example of a study she did that we were kind of helping her out with. So these are 10 subjects, five at the top, five at the bottom. Uh, they all have language activation maps painted on them. So these are subjects who are lying on a scanner and um, the contrast is words versus java lines. So they match for a bunch of different things, but basically it's things that make sense versus things that don't make sense. Right? Things that are words versus things that are not words. And what you see in every one of these subjects is a nice pattern of frontal activation, generally with about three blobs, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, um, in every one of them. But if we average them, if we apply the surface-based averaging that I showed you before, all of the frontal stuff goes away. And this has been kind of the history of the study of human language function in that researchers have a task in which every subject gives them a robust activation and then their group maps show them nothing. And so they're kind of left with this conundrum of, Am I studying individuals or am I studying like the general human brain? Um, okay, so in general, this has been called structure function mismatch. And the assumption is that structure doesn't predict function or maybe it only predicts it to a certain extent. And I think that may well be true that structure only predicts function to a certain extent, 
But I think it's not true to the extent that we have classically thought it was true. I think that there are more complicated features we can extract from structural images that predict functional properties better than we've been able to do in the past. Um, here's an example of that. So if I look at every one of these subjects, they have an activation in this kind of superior frontal, just anterior to the central sulcus. So this is the central sulcus um, here and here and here and here. <laughs> and most of them are kind of in this notch in what I guess is the middle frontal sulcus here. Um, Right, so there's like a little secondary fold here and a secondary fold there. Sorry, I'll go back and forth so you can see with, it, with and without it. And most of them have this little notch, but you know, some of them don't. Like this one, the activation isn't really in the notch. Um, this one, it's not really in the notch. And these kind of small geometric features are too small and not salient enough for a geometry only registration to align. Uh, and so they don't align. You know, some subjects do, some don't, and then you average and you get something that's kind of blurry and not very strong. Okay, so we wanted to do some work, and by we, I mostly mean um, Andrew Lee, shown up here on the left, and Adrian Dalka, uh, and try and improve on this. And the idea here is one that, you know, we tested years ago with uh, Thomas Yeo and Mertz Aventu and Polina Golan in 2009, where we didn't really have the tools to address this question as well as we can now. And the idea here, is to train some deep network to do registration. You know, Adrian is quite famous for this. Um, and we wanted to align cortical folding patterns because we know cortical folding patterns are important in terms of prediction power. But we also wanted to align something else. And in this case, the something else is an fMRI map, but it could be something other than that. It could be, you know, any of the stains that Ishtan showed you before. It could be, you know, missile stains or myelin stains. It could be transcriptomic data. It could be vascular maps, as we, you know, we saw earlier than that. And the way we do this is we build a model, which uh, Andrew calls JOSA. Uh, and what it does is it learns a set of atlases. So it'll learn kind of the, the geometric atlas, which is the core of it, and then some auxiliary map atlas. In this case, it'll be language maps. Uh, and then it learns a set of transformations. It learns a single large transformation that accounts for the large variability we see in human brains. And then it will learn a pair of smaller deformations that allow things like structure and function not to line up perfectly in any given birth, okay? Um, so here's the way we do it. Um, sorry, go through all of these. Here's the way we do it kind of more technically. We take each brain surface model, we map it to the sphere, and then we map each sphere into a 2D parameterization. Um, the 2D parameterization uh, inherits the topology of the sphere. So you, know, you go off one end, you come on the other, and the other side you go off and you reflect and come back. So it doesn't lose anything topologically. Uh, the thing it loses is metric distortion, but the metric distortion we can compute analytically in terms of the metric tensor, and we could just embed the metric tensor into everything we do and account for the distortion. And we've shown that that, that doesn't really impact us. Okay. And so by registering these two maps, I'm also registering these two spheres because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between this point, uh, every point here and there. And then similarly, uh, I'm registering the two original surfaces because of that same one-to-one -one correspondence from here to there. <clears throat> Here's what the network architecture looks like. So one of the things we don't want to do is we don't have, want the auxiliary maps to go through, through the comms of the network because we don't want to require the auxiliary map. Uh, we don't want to require that it exists at test time. These are maps that we want to have access to at training time, but not at test. And so the way this game works is we input a single um, spherical parameterization. So this is the individual subject geometry and a single individual functional map. Um, for that same subject. So here's the individual geometry, here's the individual functional map. We stick it through a UNET. This is very similar to Adrian's voxelmorph stuff. And in fact, we, we use a lot of that code. Uh, and the UNET spits out three things. It spits out a, a large intersubject transformation that accounts for the differences across subject, and then two smaller deformations that account for how geometry is formed and how function is formed separately from the single large uh, registration. Then these two top uh, transforms are composed. We get a spatial transformation for the geometry. We apply it to a learned atlas, uh, and then we com compute the, um, the the sum loss, you know, mean squared error or something, between the learned atlas and the individual geometry. And this atlas starts out um, not being very interesting, but over time we'll learn what folding patterns are stable across subjects. So we're learning both the geometry and the warp. And then similarly, we'll take these two transforms, we'll compose them, We'll compute a spatial transform that, that will apply to the functional map. And then we get that and we apply it to a functional atlas, which we'll also learn. 
And again, we want to maximize you know, the correlation or the mean squared error or minimize the mean squared error between the deformed functional map and the learned functional atlas. And critically, as I said before, this functional map doesn't go through the columns of the network. And so once we've learned this, all we're doing is basing everything on geometry, right? So anything I show you is not structure function mismatch. Any, any additional information that the network can glean is only coming from the anatomy. And so it's learning kind of constellations of local features that are predictive of functional properties. And this works pretty well. And so here's an example. This again is all Andrew's work. Um, <clears throat> here's taking Ed's maps and applying them to what, 700 subjects, I guess? I think this is the 100 left out subjects. So we train on 700. Then we train on 600, we have 100 validation, 100 tests. So these are the 100 tests. If I average them with a standard folding pattern, we get something similar to what I showed you before, this kind of sparse frontal pattern. Um, if we use multimodal surface matching, which is you know the AC, HCP thing, it's pretty similar. You know, maybe you can argue one is a tiny bit better than the other, I'm not sure. Uh, but if we apply the Joseph model, we get much more robust representation of these functional patches in, in frontal cortex and a much larger activation pattern in the temporal lobe. And so we think that this technique is learning something interesting about how we can predict functional properties in the brain and where they sit relative to folding patterns, but only from the cortical folding patterns. Um, yeah, so we, then we've quantified this. We have a version that doesn't use the, the um, semi-supervised arm, so it never sees functional maps. It's just trying to learn geometry. Uh, and so on the left, I'm, I'm showing you geometric alignment. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and so if I look at the geometric alignment of individual subjects in these two in these multiple coordinate systems, we can see the free surfer and two variants of MSM do a reasonably good job at correlating with the geometry, um, but deep learning networks do a better job. And so this one doesn't use function, this one does use function. And so the one that does use function doesn't sacrifice any geometric accuracy. It's not doing a worse job at aligning the folding patterns, even though it's aligning the functional data. But none of these networks that are all only ever seeing geometry do a better job at aligning functional properties than just a simple kind of rotations on the sphere, so rigid alignment on the sphere. Um, but the Joseph model, again, only based on the structural properties, does a significantly better job. So, so individual subjects overlap better in this space, in the Joseph space, than in any of these other spaces. We've also applied this to um, cortical parcellation. Um, yeah, and so because the cortical system works quite well and we get very nice alignment across subjects, uh, let me just skip this. It, you can see that it does a better job than our existing free server parcellation. And I think I had some dice scores here. Yeah, so and so uh, the dice scores are really quite high. They're, they're close to uh, 0.9 in, in most cortical areas. So blue is free surfer uh, and red is is the par parcellation with JOSA. And here we're not attaching a segmentation head to the JOSA model. So it's not that we're, we're doing some clever segmentation. We're just taking the atlas and mapping it back to individuals. So I expect this is a lower bound. I think we'll be able to kind of nudge this above 0.9 into the you know, 0.91, 0.92. Uh, accuracy range. Oops. Okay. Any questions on that stuff before I continue? Yeah, Bruce, I have a question. So in the previous mm -hmm. slide, um, how are constructed the manual labels? Oh, uh, so these were manual labels. This is the Desican Turi Turville Desican Desican Kiliani Corville DKT. So Desican Ron Kiliani, Jason Turville, and um, Rahul Desican uh, manually labeled. So Rule and Ron, I think, did 40-ish initially, and then Jason redid it with 100. So these are 100 subjects, um, uh, and then split into training and test. So they're manual labeling to the cortical folds, right? And they're done on surface models. So you, know, you kind of draw a boundary, and you say, don't extend further than here, don't extend further than there, and then flood fill the interior. It's not that hard. And another question is, uh, regarding the functional maps, uh, did you guys analyze if that have a good correlation with the patterns of distribution of vessels or white matter tracks or? Oh man, wouldn't it be nice to know that? No, we don't have that data. Um, you know, these are just kind of standard MP ranges and then EPI, two, two and a half millimeter EPI scans for the functional maps. Um, you know, there are people getting astonishing uh, vascular maps. I don't know if you've seen any of the stuff that John Polliman has been doing, but he's been getting these like, 300-ish micron vascular maps at 7T. They're beautiful. Um, but no, we don't have that data on the same subjects. So I would love to know the answer to that question. Great. Um, okay. Thanks, Bruce. Yes, mm -hmm. amazing. 
Um, I had a question about the functional maps that were learned. Were they a sort of single task functional maps? And if did you look at whether they were preserved across multiple tasks? Yeah, another great question. Um, so it is possible that, you know, there's uh, one ring to rule them all, that there's one perfect registration that does everything. It aligns, you know, attentional tasks and functional tasks and visual tasks. It aligns areas of atrophy and Alzheimer's disease. And that may be true, right? Like the, it may be that all of this stuff is really tightly coupled and we just can't see it. Um, we are going to test at least some of that hypothesis. We don't, obviously don't have data for all of it, uh, but we will train on a much wider range of tasks and see if the accuracy is preserved. So if we add you know, the full range of HTTP tasks uh, and we include EVS data, do we still get these nice alignment function uh, frontally? Maybe, we'll see. Um, and then the same thing is true of Alzheimer's disease, right? Like if we, if we look at uh, atrophy in, in Alzheimer's and Abbey subjects, do the maps of atrophy line up better in a coordinate system where there was some you know, memory task that we expect to line things in the medial temporal lobe? They might, but I don't know the answer to that either. I, that's another question I would love to know the answer to, but I don't. Okay, on to some other stuff. Okay, so this uh, bit, so that was kind of the tangential directions. I'm now gonna talk about the surface normal direction. This is joint work with um, my friend, Marty Serino, uh, uh, Divya Bardarajan and Taylor uh, Zhang. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about two different parts here. One is what do we mean by the normal direction? Um, I'll get back to that in a second. And then the second is the work that Taylor's been doing with me and, and Eugenio and Yale um, and Sean uh, on, um, and so Ulo Ponte on um, uh, generating the surface models of intermediate boundaries, right? So can we model in the, in the XVO MR, we see infragranular and supergranular quite clearly. And so can we segment that accurately? And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, okay. So the way I showed you in the beginning, this kind of standard histological analysis technique that uses Laplace models from EM uh, to, to derive streamlines that connect the bottom of the gray matter and the top of the gray matter. Okay? And this is what's used to establish correspondence between the surfaces and talk about, you know, so that we can meaningfully say, what is this, what is a point in the cortex? Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so we took the Laplace models. We took a scan of my brain. This was like 30 years ago. I'm pretty sure my brain doesn't look like this anymore, um, but I really don't want to know. And we divided the cortex into six layers. So we just divided it up equally. Not using the MR data, we just divided it into six equal compartments. You know, think six cortical layers, but they're not really six cortical layers. Then we tossed the MRI data. We don't care about the MRI data anymore. And we filled the interior of every compartment with the same intensity, right? And so this is what it looks like. Um, and so this is a volume that has no boundaries, right? Every layer has exactly the same intensity everywhere in space. It has infinite CNR. There's no noise in this data. Um, so it's the perfect data set. And one would think that it would be uh, a good data set for um, testing some of these techniques. Okay. So, oh, my cat's unhappy. Sorry. Um, okay. So just for fun, we also added a stream of Janari. So you can see this, whoops. Here, you can see this bright bit here. So somewhere in the calcium sulcus, I stuck some bright um, voxels in uh, in the middle of layer four, okay? And so now we're gonna apply these histological techniques that I showed you before, this um, uh, observer-independent 2D histology to this data. And you know it's kind of a known fact of elementary topology that if I take a surface of G to zero and I cut it with a plane, I'll get some number of closed curves, you know, in this case, you know, if you get more than one, you're kind of in trouble. What do you do? But we pick one in, that has a single closed curve in the kernel section, and then we applied this technique to it. We looked at the Mahalanobis distance between adjacent blocks of trans traversals, right? So we, we take the lower boundary, we take the upper boundary, we, we clamp the voltage to zero and one, we solve the Laplace equation, and then we look at the streamlines going from very wet boundary to peel surface. <laughs> and those streamlines have a lot of uh, properties that we like. They're pretty much parallel, they're non-self-intersecting, they intersect the boundaries at right angles, and this is all known from, from EM theory. Um, anyway, so we applied this to our data, uh, we looked at the Mahalanobis distance, and what you can see is this crazy noisy set of spikes throughout the brain in this data that has no boundaries. 
right? And so these red bars show um, the peaks at the boundaries of the synthetic V1. And we'll zoom in on this and I'll just say, okay, here's a peak that shouldn't occur. There is no boundary there. It's the middle of V1 and there's no change in intensity anywhere. Why are we getting a peak? So if we look at this spot, the peak occurs here. So it's this set of traversals and this set of traversals. And you can see what's happening here is that the cortical folding patterns are such that the cortex is mostly in plane here. That is, my cut is mostly perpendicular to the cortex. You know, the cortex lies in the plane mostly. But as I go into the sulcus, so in this direction towards the red traversals, the cut is becoming more oblique. And these, these planes are more, have a tangential component to them. Uh, and so the cortical areas, I gotta move my zoom windows around. Cortical areas, I'm sorry, the cortical layers here look much thicker than that up here, but they're not, they're the same thickness. It's just because there's an oblique component to my cutting plane. And so that oblique component makes the, uh, the streamline features that I extract from the data look very different in this block than this block. It looks like a change in cortical architecture. I mean, you could see it on the slide, right? It looks like, you know, if you had that, whoops, back. Um, this stuff looks like a different cortical architecture than this stuff. It's not, it's because of unaccounted for through plane folding. Okay, okay so in this paper, to be fair, they suggested that you should only apply these techniques in regions where the dot product between the cutting plane and the cortex is less than 60 degrees. Um, this is why they did more than 10 brains because they had to do sagittal analysis in some brains and coronal in other brains. Um, but if I look at a map of dot product, you know, kind of angle with the coronal plane, there are no regions of the brain, of the human brain, that I can study um, to find a Brodmann area that obey this, that, you know, uh, this constraint, right? You know, if there's a Brodmann area like stuck somewhere in, right here, maybe I can look at it coronally. But the folding is too complicated and too high frequency to allow this technique to work over any stretch of brain. You can do it in 3D, um, and that really doesn't help. And I'll explain why in a second. So if I do 3D analysis on the synthetic data, I still get like these little swirly patterns, these putative boundaries in the data that has no uh, actual gradients in them. So why does this happen? So if we look at one of these here, uh, it comes from this little bit of the volume. It's kind of the fundus of the sulcus. And so I built a model of the brain um, shown here. So here's the white matter, here's the gray matter, here's the CSF. Um, and then I simply clamp the voltage at the gray white boundary to zero, the voltage up here to one, and I solve the Laplace equation. And these are the streamlines of Laplace that you get from that. And what you can see is that the major drawback of the Laplace approach to this type of uh, data is that it confounds geometry and intensity. That is, the streamlines change their shape based on the geometry of the cortex, irrespective of what's in the underlying data. And so if you take like a streamline like this, you know, it's curving here. So it's spending a significantly greater amount of time in layer one than some straight streamline here. And even worse from my perspective is the streamlines that are far from this, this geometric change kind of feel the influence of this geometry change and they're not straight. And so if you want to do things like measure cortical thickness, then I think it's very difficult to argue that Laplace is a good way to do that. I know Katie has done some work using Laplace to measure longitudinal thickness, so change in thickness. And I think there, um, I think that's a different story. So I think they might have a good application there. But for characterizing individual cortical properties, they confound geometry and, and structure. And we know that, you know, and this is what we're trying to figure out. Like, what is the, the what are the properties of the underlying gray matter relative to the cortical folding matters? And so if the folds mess up our ability to sample the, the cortical properties, then I think we're in trouble. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on this either, um, but essentially we kind of take this degree of freedom out of it. We treat it like a registration problem kind of, um, except with no data term. So this is kind of an odd registration problem where all we care about is the regularization. That is, we want to find a, a vector field that connects the two surfaces um, and we want the regularization properties to be that it's not too far from the surface normal and it's um, and the stream and the vectors are parallel. And so we can kind of do that directly and build a vector field that connects the surfaces and use them for cortical sampling. This is what they look like on the surface. So this is the surface normals. These are the ones we derive. Um, and then if we apply this to the same data, these big swirly patterns we saw with Laplace kind of go away. And there's a little bit of stuff left. And I think these are sampling artifacts because this was done at 200 microns and, it's, um, and, and we'll go away where we, where we have uh, 
um, if we have higher resolution. Okay, so that's all for that. So we go on to the last part, unless there are questions. Okay, on to imaging and analysis tools. <laughs> okay, so this is Divya's work. Um, Divya worked very hard with us on the ex vivo MRI. Uh, you know, when we first started this project, five or six, well, I mean, we started the ex vivo imaging like 20 years ago, but when Divya came five or six years ago and we wanted to do a better job at ex vivo MR, I told her that we, you know, we wanted to get to 180 microns, but we'd be happy to get, but we, sorry, we wanted to get to 150, but we'd settle for 180. And David was like, no, no, we're getting to 120. We can definitely get 120. And I kind of thought she was crazy, but she was absolutely right. She dragged us to 120 microns and the data is beautiful. And at 120 microns, you have to care about all sorts of crap that you shouldn't have to care about. You know, so we have to care about kind of these microscopic iron deposition in the cortex that cause these tiny field distortions that displace the data by 100 microns, 150 microns. Um, and so the Divian developed a series of techniques that use the gradient echo scans that we're collecting anyway uh, to build things like field maps at the native resolution of the data. Uh, and they're not, we don't really build field maps, we kind of um, build displacement maps that, that account for the displacements due to B0 distortions. And so this is a GIF that toggles back and forth between uncorrected and corrected. And you can see all this laminar architecture in the cerebellum. Um, this, I think, is a, a great ape who um, died of natural causes, and we scanned. And relative to the, the discussions about blood vessels, you know, in, in ex vivo, we can't use, you know, almost all in vivo techniques that detect blood vessels do it because the blood is moving. They use the fact that the blood is moving to derive contrast from the images. But here the blood is not moving because these are ex vivo brains. And you can see that the field distortions blur out a lot of these vessels uh, and they're recovered by these tiny little corrections that Divya makes. So we can see the vessels much more clearly. And the same thing is true of the history of Genari, right? It's kind of blurred out in the initial data, but the corrections recover it. <clears throat> so we've applied this to a bunch of 120 micron data sets. We have manually labeled area 44 and 45. Um, sorry, that's not true. So we predict the location of 44, 45, and then we manually label the infragranular, supergranular boundaries in this data set. This is, you know, these 120 micron data sets have giant numbers of voxels. Uh, they would take forever to manually label the whole thing. We focused on 44 and 45 because we have a specific project on that, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but so we gave Taylor the task of building a whole brain infragranular, supergranular segmentation, but only gave him data sets in which about 3% of the voxels were labeled. So these labels in 44, 45. And to be fair, we also had a couple of data sets where we had um, sparsely sampled across the whole brain, entire slices labeled. So it's not just 44, 45, but it's largely 44, 45. And 44, 45 is um, a granular cortex. It doesn't even have a layer four. So it has a very different architecture than like M1, or actually M1 is disgranular, than like V1 or, or S1, this kind of thing. <clears throat> and so Taylor built this very interesting architecture and it's one of the success stories of, of deep learning. Um, I don't know if, you know, to me, I write 100 deep learning algorithms, 95 of them are disappointing, four of them are a little bit better than the state of the art, and one is just amazing. And this one is just amazing to me. And so what Taylor did is he built a cascaded architecture where we have a bunch of units. So the problem is that we wanna, we wanna retain global context because it's so important in the brain to know where you are, but we don't want to sacrifice resolution. And we're never going to stuff a 120 micron scan into any GPO you know, in the next 10 years. And so what Taylor did instead is he starts with a down sample scan at a relatively small field of view. So I think these are 128 cubed <clears throat> inputs to the UNET at whatever resolution that comes out to be, you know, like one millimeter. Uh, he runs it through a UNET and then he cascades the UNET to a second UNET, which is upsampled by a factor of two. And then he keeps this cascade going. And so that the second to last layer of this UNET gets cascaded, uh, concatted to the second the second layer of this unit, gets upsampled and concatted, and we get the sequence of units until we get to the, the intrinsic resolution of the data, 120 micron, okay? So that solves one problem, which is that we get global context from the earlier cascades, but we don't sacrifice resolution because we're applying it at the highest resolution. And then the second problem, actually, I don't think I have a slide in the second problem. The second problem is um, this issue that we're only giving them 3% of the pixels. And those 3% are not representative of the architecture everywhere else. That is, you know, Broca's area looks very different than V1. And so Taylor employed this technique called cross pseudo supervision, in which instead of training a single network, you know, a single cascaded network, 
he trained a set of them with three. And in the labeled region, each one of these three networks is trained in the normal supervised sense, right? You compute dice or, or categorical cross entropy, whatever it is, and you train them normally. But outside of the labeled region, you let them train each other. So you take one network and it says, I think it's super granular, and the other network says, no, it's infragranular, and the network two gets penalized because it disagreed with network one. And it's the kind of thing that, I don't know, I would never have thought would work, but in fact, it works really nicely. Uh, and so here are some of the results. This is the whole brain we compared against N and UNIT. It's not a terribly fair comparison because N and UNIT is fully supervised, and getting it to be semi supervised is difficult or, or cross pseudo supervised. Um, and so the results are really quite accurate. Here's um, some quantitative comparisons. This is an ablation study just showing that each one of the little components does give us a little boosted accuracy. But the purple versus the blue are the dice comparison of NN unit versus the, the cross pseudo supervised cascaded unit. And it really, you know, it gets dices of above 0.8, which are really pretty good for these very thin kind of uh, elongated structures. Okay, on to the last part of the talk, um, which is our attempts to develop a new microscopy technique. And this is something that David Boaz and I started, oh, I don't know, a long time ago now, maybe 15 years. Uh, and so we've been pursuing this technique called optical coherence tomography. And it's because resolution comes at such a terrible price in MR, right? We, we double or we have our voxel sizes, we get one eighth of the signal from the voxel, and then we have to scan, you know, 64 times as long in order to recover that SNR because SNR is, is, uh, goes to the square root of time. And so we can push the resolution of the MR, and we have, but we're unlikely to get down to a resolution where we see things like neurons or small fascicles. <clears throat> Standard histology has distortions because of the cutting. You know, Nisvan showed some very nice results getting rid of these distortions, but it's very difficult for me to imagine removing distortions at the scale that would allow you to say, follow an axon across a cut. Like these are just super difficult things to do. And so we've been pursuing optical coherence tomography, which is a technique invented at MIT in the early nineties. It's like a billion dollar industry in the retina. And the reason it's so important in the retina is that it's an interferometric technique in which the laser light, which is used um, in OCT penetrates into the tissue. And so in the retina, you can image retinal um, vasculature it, you know, deep in the retina. We use it because it penetrates fixed tissue. So we take a, a block of fixed tissue, we put it on the stage, we have a laser light that penetrates it perpendicularly and the light penetrates a few hundred microns. And so this enables us to image under the cut surface. You know, you might think, okay, in histology, you cut that image, in OCT, you're imaging then cutting, is that such a big deal? And to me, the answer is yes, it's a giant deal. And the reason it's a giant deal is that we're imaging before we introduce these distortions due to cutting and tearing of the tissue that are so difficult to recover from. And so with OCT, we can just stack the slices up because they're in register when we acquire them. I will say that there's some amazing images coming out of like London and the hip CT group with um, Peter Lee and, and Claire Walsh. Uh, and then the clearing just keeps getting better. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. So here's an example of an OCT image. <clears throat> this is a human medulla. Uh, this is work with David Buzz, um, who since left us to go to BU and Hui Wang and, and um, Caroline Mignon. And so the OCT data is just beautiful. It's, you know, we get down to single micron resolution. Uh, by single micron, I mean around three micron. Um, and it's a wide field of view. In OCT, we collect a single, uh, an entire A line, an entire line in depth with each acquisition. So it's, it's orders of magnitude faster than two photon. Uh, and so we can get wide fields of view uh, while, while retaining high resolution. So here's an example in the human medial temporal lobe where we can image these mossy fibers you know, and see them as they're crossing the hippocampal fissure. <clears throat> Another trick we can play with OCT is we can put polarization on the incoming light. And this means when we look at the polarization state of the returned light, we can infer something about the optic axis of the thing that we were imaging. And specifically, because myelin is birefringent, we can look at the optic axis of axons directly. That is the imaging data, we're not inferring what the axis is by doing something like computing a structure tensor from the intensity volumes, we're directly measuring the optic axis. And that is absolutely critical because in regions where the fibers are packed so tightly that we can't resolve individual fibers, the only way to get to get uh, sorry, to get orientation from the imaging data is if you can resolve the myelin sheaths. And so now we're talking about getting down to you know, a couple hundred nanometers. 
and that's you know well beyond the diffusion limit, uh, the diffraction limit of, um, of visible light. You need to go to techniques like EM and tiny little samples. Uh, but with the with the OCT, we can put the polarization state on, and we can directly image orientation of the fibers. And so you can see here at the bottom um, that even if I cut it in different planes, so XY, XZ, and YZ, we don't see any cutting artifacts. I can't see the slices because they're all in register from on, from the time I acquired them. Uh, another trick that we've played lately is to put a second source on the acquisition side. This lets us measure 3D orientation. So with a single source, you can only measure in plane orientation, and you can't tell the difference between through plane fibers and no fiber. And that's, of course, of minimal interest in the human brain, where the fibers are, are going all over the place. But with the second light source, we can resolve 3D orientation and get something like a diffusion tensor image, but at the scale of about three microns. Yale has already shown you the vascular stuff. Um, one of the reasons that we started pursuing vascular registration was if we look at OCT and MR, um, and we do kind of standard image-based registration, so like mutual information shown on the left, the interior of the white matter is mostly uniform. And the vessels are only a tiny fraction volume-wise, like percent of the volume of the, of the white matter. It's like, I don't know, half a percent or something. You will lose the statistics. And so, there aren't so standard uh, intensity based similarity functions will not align the vessels. Um, so, what we do instead is this is work with Adrian Dalka, where we embedded a segmentation network into the registration. And we kind of use the same super, semi supervised trick I showed you before for the cortex, where we teach the network that I want you to align, you know, I want you to maximize the mutual information, uh, but I also want you to align vessels. I know where the vessels are in the source image, I know where the target image is, and I want you to align these in this training set. Uh, and so the network is forced to learn the intensity characteristics of a vessel. We don't need the vascular segmentation at, at inference time, only at training time. And so if I go back and forth between these two, you can see on the left, that if I just use MI, it doesn't align the vasculature, but on the right, it does. And so this gives us some hope that we're doing a better registration in these kind of big uniform regions. Um, <clears throat> then this is work with Eugenio and Harsha Gazula. Uh, and this is part of a big project with the Allen Institute at University of Washington with Dirk Keen and Edeline and Christine McDonald. And here, you know, the way standard histology is done is you take a coronal slide photograph and you're like, mm, I think that's area 44, cut me a chunk of tissue there. But of course, we have a huge amount of information in vivo that we could project onto those slabs if only we could reconstruct 3D volumes and kind of register them to in vivo coordinate systems. And so this is what Eugenio and um, Kartik uh, and Harsha have been working on. We also do 3D scans of the exterior surface of the brain. We have a low resolution scanner that we use in the autopsy suite at UW. They wheel the corpse in and image it um, right away because this tissue isn't going to be fixed. So we can't do the 70 hour scans. We can't even do hour long scans. These scans are like 40 minutes. There's a clock that starts ticking uh, where they have to do autopsy. But the result is that we can synthesize MR volumes. Um, I think Eugenio showed you the synthesis R stuff yesterday. And we can use it to project in vivo atlases onto the slabs and guide the histological processing. Um, and whoops, this is a movie just showing this is an in vivo atlas. This is again the Desiccan Kiliani Turville atlas that we're projecting onto the slabs. So someone can go up and say, you know, I want the middle frontal gyrus and we'll automatically show where that is and let the pathologist extract it. Um, so we put all this together. This is actually a fairly old slide. Um, I think we can hopefully do better one of these days. This is 150 micron X3 MR, surface models derived from it, 55 micron MR of a small block, three micron OCT, and then a little under half a micron missile stains as the movie progresses. So here we're starting kind of from the outside, we see the surface model, then we see the 150 micron MR, and now we see the 55 micron MR, we go in further, uh, we can see the three micron OCT, and then the missile stain uh, projected into where it sits in the cortex. Oops. Uh, we have a, a project with a group in France, uh, I keep saying that, uh, with a group in Italy, and also with David Buzz at BU and Patrick Hoff, who's a neuroanatomist at Mount Sinai. And essentially, we do x MR, we take out a block, we send it to David at BU, he does OCT. The OCT serves as an undistorted coordinate system with micron resolution that we can use to take, uh, so, sorry, so the block goes to Italy, it gets cleared and light sheet imaged with a bunch of stains. This is DAPI and Calretinin and somatostatin and NUN. Uh, and then because the OCT is undistorted, we can use it to remove the distortions from the light sheet data at the micron scale. The OCT is uh, um, 
I guess the OCT from BU is not quite three micron, it's probably like five or six. Um, but we can remove these microscopic distortions and then project it back to um, whole brain models and start to build statistics on how often do uh, calretin positive neurons occur in layer two of area 44 or 45. So this has been a huge amount of work and kudos to Yale to getting it working. Um, but we're kind of at the stage where we're hoping to be in production mode in the next couple of years. Okay, that's all. Any questions on that? Um, and I'll leave this slide up because a lot of people contributed this one. I have a, one question more a curiosity. Is there any of these? So they look amazing, these OCT scans of a fast field of view. There is any full data set online for a big chunk of the brain for those images? Yeah. So so one of the so the so this is part of an NIH brain initiative project, uh, part of the brain initiative called BICAN, which is the Bell Brain Initiative Cell Atlas Network, and we are required to publicly distribute our data sets not very long after we we acquire them. They go through a, uh, an archive called Dandy, which Satya Gosh runs at MIT. I don't know if you know Satya. If you email me, I'll point you at it. But they're all publicly available. Um, we've done sixteen brains, I think. Through MR, not every one of them has gone all the way through OCT and light sheet, but something like 10 or 12 have. So, so and uh, we can access through the link that was in your slide. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know. You can find the Dandy archive, they're online there. Um, if you have trouble finding it, you should just email me and I'll point you in the right direction. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? Christian. Um, Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, my understanding is that the axial resolution of OCT is limited by the bandwidth of the superluminescent diode. And yep. I thought that was sort of typically in the order of 10 microns. How do you... It depends. Sorry, it depends on how broadband your source is. Yes. So we, use very, so we use a very broadband source and we get to about three microns. I think okay. the data I showed you was like six microns. And we're building one now that gets to three. Right. So we're probably not going to get much better than three. And the truth is, the speckle noise is high enough that we probably, even if we can get better than three, it won't be very useful resolution. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, let's uh, thank Bruce again. I'll see you back in Boston at the supper. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we're going to break for half an hour and resume. What time are we resuming? Um, 11.30. 30. Okay, so for those of you uh, watching online, we will resume at 11.30. We could be 5.30. Yeah, 5.30 in Boston.